Well, this morning I'd like to return to Philippians chapter 4, and I would like to uh, just deal with one of the other truths that are in this text, um, and one that is very reassuring, one that is a tremendous blessing. And I've already told you many times what that is, so I won't tell you again, but let me just simply read Philippians chapter 4, verses 1 through 9, and uh, just to let you know, we're going to be focusing on verses 6 and 7. Paul writes to the church at Philippi, Therefore, my beloved brethren, whom I long to see, my joy and crown, in this way stand firm in the Lord, my beloved. I urge Eodi and I urge Syntyche to live in harmony in the Lord. Indeed, true companion, I ask you also to help these women who have shared my struggle in the cause of the gospel, together with Clement also and the rest of my fellow workers who names, whose names are in the book of life. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say, rejoice. Let your gentle spirit be known to all men. The Lord is near. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God, and the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brethren, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is of good repute, if there is any excellence and if anything worthy of praise, Dwell on these things, the things that you have learned and received and heard and seen in me. Practice these things, and the God of peace will be with you. Amen. Well, may the Lord bless his word to our hearing of this morning. Now, Paul gives to us in this particular reading several things for us to think about this morning that will help us in a variety of ways, certainly with our Christian growth with our unity as believers, and with our peace of mind. <laughs> he first of all tells us, and again, I'll, he's directing us to the church of Philippi, but we do understand that this is direction for the church of all ages. We have everything we need to direct us in what we are to believe and how we are to live. So he first of all tells us that we should stand fast in the Lord, we should be steadfast, we should be stable in Christ. He says in verse 1, Therefore, my beloved brethren, whom I long to see, my joy and my crown, in this way stand firm in the Lord, my beloved. Now, why do we need such an exhortation? It's because we are in the middle of, of a spiritual battle. And again, here's where I have the opportunity to bring in what Dr. Ferguson reminded us of on Wednesday evening. As he was reminding us, as Jesus was exhorting his disciples and preparing them for the warfare they were going to have to face, he reminds them of this very thing, and he says, to be forewarned is to be forearmed. If you know this in advance, you'll be ready for it. Well, we are in a warfare, and our enemy has many things that he can use against us to try to weaken us and to turn us away from Jesus, from his truth from one another, but he says we are to stand our ground, stand firm in Christ. Now, one of Satan's most effective strategies is, of course, to divide in order that he may conquer, and it appears that's what he was doing in Philippi as he had caused these two women to become at odds with one another. And so Paul encourages them to be reconciled, and he urges his comrade and the congregation there to help them. Division disrupts and weakens the church and it gives the enemy a foothold to break the whole fellowship apart. Now Paul tells us instead of focusing on differences, we should be focusing on the blessings that we share in common instead when he says in verse 4, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. He also says, as we deal with one another, we should deal gently rather than pushing the issues, especially understanding that our Lord is everywhere and He sees everything and He desires peace. Paul writes in verse 5, let your gentle spirit be known to all men. The Lord is near. And as Solomon also writes in Proverbs 15 verse 1, 
A gentle answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. But he says we should also be careful that we do not let our anxieties destroy our peace because it can also fuel our divisions. Anxiety is basically our fears that things are not going to work out well for us. Um, worry is something that not only affects us personally, but it also affects those who are around us. It makes us focus on ourselves. It makes us focus on our needs rather than on how we should be helping others. Well, instead of letting fear control us, we need to do what the Apostle Paul tells us to do here, bring our concerns to the Lord in prayer. We need to entrust our concerns to Him. If we do, He says He will give us the peace we need, not only internal peace, personal peace, but the peace that we need to be a source of peace to the fellowship. Now, this morning what I'd like to do is to focus on that particular issue, how we can overcome anxiety, how we can overcome worry. Now, first of all, we do need to understand that Paul is talking about overcoming fear. What he means when he says, be anxious for nothing, the word he uses means this, to have an anxious concern based on apprehension about possible danger or misfortune. To be worried about it, to be anxious about it, it means to be uneasy, to be troubled, or a word we all understand, fearful. That's what anxiety is. That's what worry is. It's a fear, a fear that things are not going to go well with us in one or more areas. And I think I don't have to say anything more about it. We all know what anxiety and worry are all about. Now, the way that Paul phrases this in the way he writes it indicates that this is something that they're already going through. There's different ways you can say things in the Greek language, and he's not saying here you should never allow yourself to start worrying. In other words, you're at peace. Don't start getting out of sorts. But what he's saying is you are worried, you are anxious, and you need to stop being anxious. Well, what is it they were worried about? Well, as you look through the, the letter he writes to them, it could have been the Judaizers. He did warn them about them in chapter 3, verse 2. He says, beware of the dogs, beware of the evil workers, beware of the false circumcision. Now, again, he's referring to the Judaizers who were the ones telling the people of God that they needed to not only believe in Jesus, but also to keep the ceremonial law in order to be saved, the law of Moses. Now, certainly Paul included, meant to include them, but his statement, I want you to notice, is, is much broader than that. He says, be anxious for nothing. In other words, do not worry about anything, not just the Judaizers, but about anything. Now, we've seen that anxiety and fear can destroy our peace. It can destroy the peace of the local fellowship. It can do many harmful things to us the greatest of which perhaps is keeping us from doing what the Lord calls us to do. Again, Dr. Ferguson reminded us this past Wednesday that intimidation, fear, is our enemy's main weapon. You know, he likes to make himself look big so that we sort of creep back into the shadows. His, his bark is worse than his bite, as it were. So he strikes fear into our hearts so that we will not do what the Lord calls us to do, which is, of course, shine his lights in the world. Fear is an enemy that we need to overcome, one that we're actually commanded to overcome so that we can move forward. Now, again, what are the things that we're anxious about? Because it's not just that. We're anxious about a lot of things, and anxiety in any area can actually harm us. Be anxious for nothing. Now, what are the things that we're anxious about? As I thought about this, I thought it might be easier to name the things that we're not anxious about, the things that don't concern us because we virtually are concerned about everything. We're concerned about our health, whether it's going to hold up. At least some of us are, right? 
whether we're going to have to endure some kind of a long-term disability, whether we're going to get a terminal disease. You know, cancer often turns out to be a terminal disease. Not always, thankfully. But whenever we get symptoms that we can't explain, especially if they're internal pains, what is it that we usually think that we have? There's cancer in my body. So we assume the worst. We get worried. We get concerned. We don't assume the best. We don't assume that it's benign, but rather that it's malignant. The thought of death concerns us, that one day we're going to be buried in the ground, at least our bodies. We don't like to think about it, but we know it's inevitable, particularly whenever you drive by a cemetery, right, and you see all the tombstones. I mean, what do you think? What I think is, someday I'm going to be laid in the ground as well. It's appointed unto man once to die, unless the Lord, of course, comes before we die. We're anxious about our relationships, whether the friendships we have are going to last, whether those that are broken are going to be restored. If we're single, we're concerned about whether or not we're going to meet that special person that one day we're going to marry. If we're married, we're concerned whether our marriage is going to last the rest of our lives. If we have children, whether we're going to be close to them or whether we're going to be alienated from them. If we're young, we're, we're also anxious about the future. You know, whether we're going to be able to afford to attend college, whether we're going to pass our classes, whether we're going to graduate. And then after that, it's worry about finances, whether we're going to get that good job that's going to provide for us. If we have a job, whether we're going to be able to keep the job, whether we're going to be able to advance, whether we're going to have the money we need to live on, whether we're going to have enough to retire, and whether our retirement funds are going to last to the end of our lives. We worry about spiritual issues, whether or not we belong to the Lord, whether or not we're going to be able to overcome our sins, whether we're going to be able to make it to heaven, whether while we're here, we're going to find the strength to confess Jesus before the world as he calls us to, whether we're going to be able to fulfill what he made us and called us to do, whether those we love and care about our fathers and our mothers, our sisters and our brothers, and our children, whether they will love him, whether they will love his word, whether they will trust him and follow him. We're also concerned about this world. I mean, look at how bad the world's getting, how difficult it's becoming to stand out as Christians in this world and how it's basically making us afraid so we recede, as it were, out of the light and into the shadows. Can we live as Christians and not alienate ourselves from everyone? We're concerned about whether or not we're going to be willing to pay the price that the Lord calls us to pay for living as lights in the world. Now, this is not an exhaustive list, though it may have sounded like one. There are so many things that we can find to worry about. Some of us have the added complication of being those who naturally tend to worry. And, you know, you can get so much into that way of thinking that you don't feel right unless you have something to worry about. Now, some of us don't have that particular complication, but all of us are concerned about something. So the question is, how can we overcome it? Because Paul does say, be anxious for nothing. He says, well, first of all, let me just put it this way. If the Lord commands something... We know that he also gives us the ability to do it. It is possible to overcome it. Certainly, if it's, if it's possible to overcome the greater things, as we were looking at examples uh, from Scripture, I mean, if God gave us a son, how will he not also give us all things? If he gives us the greater, he's certainly going to give us the less. Well, if it's possible to overcome the greater fears, certainly it's, it's possible to overcome the lesser fears. And we see that in the Lord, it is possible to overcome even the greatest fears. We note that Peter and John were not afraid when they stood before the Sanhedrin, or if they were afraid, at least they had enough courage to overcome that fear. When the Sanhedrin told them, you will not teach or preach anymore in the name of Jesus Christ, they said, we're not going to listen to you. That took a tremendous amount of courage, but we're going to continue to teach and preach what the Lord has called us to. Stephen, I think he is the greatest example, was brought up in the, uh, in the prayer time. 
is the greatest example of courage when he preached the gospel before the Jewish leaders and indicted them for killing their Messiah. And he knew full well what was going to happen to him. I mean, he didn't know with absolute certainty, but I think there was the assumption. If I say this, if I preach what I believe the Lord would have me to say, they're going to kill me. That's exactly what they did. But he was willing to do it. Just think of the Apostle Paul who wasn't afraid when he testified before kings, when he faced persecution and imprisonment and death. I mean, he was even killed once and raised again from the dead, and then he was again executed as a martyr, all for the sake of the gospel. They overcame their fears. So the question is, how can we overcome our anxieties, our worries, our concerns, our fears, and have this kind of courage? Well, first of all, we need to understand where anxiety, fear, actually comes from. It is a lack of faith. It's a, a doubting the Lord. I mean, ask yourself this question. How many times have you found yourself when you're faced with your concerns, your worries, your anxieties, and you're talking about them, that you think and you talk and you act and you make decisions as though God wasn't even in the picture? as though he didn't exist, as though he had never said anything. When you ask yourselves questions like this, what are we going to do? How are we going to get through this? How are we going to survive? Then we're really acting as though God doesn't exist. I think sometimes we really do forget that he exists. And I think that's one of our problems. Sometimes we forget that the God who does exist has made certain promises to us. Promises that he is guaranteed through the work of His Son. Paul writes in 2 Corinthians 1.20, a passage we looked at last week as we were considering our resources in the Lord Jesus. He says, For as many as are the promises of God in Him, they are yes. Therefore also through Him is our amen to the glory of God through us. So Paul here is telling us that Jesus, through his life and his death, has guaranteed all the promises of God to us, and he has promised to provide everything we need, and so he tells us, don't, don't worry. Maybe we remember his promises, but we don't believe that he's going to give them to us if we ask, because we're not good enough, because we messed up here, we messed up there, we don't we don't measure up, <clears throat> but I hope you understand the promises are not contingent upon, they're not conditional upon your faithfulness, they're contingent upon Jesus and your ability to look to Him in faith. Now the real source of our fear is that we do not trust God. If we are to overcome our fear, we need to overcome our lack of faith. So. How do we do that? Well, first of all, we need to remember that, that God has made every provision for that. That's the reason, again, why He gave us Jesus, so that Jesus could give us His Holy Spirit so that we would believe, that we would have faith, and that we would trust. And we need to understand that God has given us the Spirit not only for that purpose, but also to give us courage in order to overcome our fears. Paul writes, to Timothy in 2 Timothy 1 verse 7. For God has not given us a spirit of timidity, but of power and love and discipline. Sometimes we're afraid because we have quenched and grieved the Spirit of God either through our lack of faith or because of our sin or because we haven't been seeking the Lord the way that we should. But when the Spirit of God is strong in us, courage is also strong in us. But secondly, through the working of the Spirit in our souls and by His Word richly dwelling in us, that's how we can have courage. By the way, I just remind you again, last Lord's Day we saw the Apostle Paul telling us that not just to let the Word of Christ dwell richly in you or to live in you richly, not just a little bit, I mean dwell not just as a transient guest that sort of comes in and out of your life, but let it remain in your thinking. Let it continue to be your pattern of life. Let it influence your decisions to dwell in you richly. Don't, he's not saying just, you know, 
give it permission. But what he is saying is it must dwell in you richly. And when it does dwell in you richly, the Spirit of God will use it to give you courage and to give you strength. Because one of the things contained in the Word of God, of course, is the, are the promises of God. And we need to look to the Lord to fulfill those promises. And that's essentially what Paul tells us in our text in Philippians 4, verses 6 and 7. He says, be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God and the peace of God which surpasses all comprehension will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. So what we need to do when we're faced with anxiety, when we're faced with fears, we need to find the promise that applies to the particular concern, particular need that we have that we're afraid is not going to be met. We need to look to the Lord in prayer to fulfill that promise. As we have asked for what He's promised to give us, in faith we should thank Him that He has heard us. We need to trust that He will meet that need. And then we need to rest in Him which essentially is how we find peace because we know that the Lord is going to be true to His promises. Now, we do need to think about this for just a moment. The Lord has made certain promises, but they're not always exactly the promises we may think they may be. For instance, the Lord has not promised, notwithstanding all the health and wealth folk, that we would enjoy perfect health. We do know that there were those in scriptures, Paul himself, that struggled, and we're going to see that this evening as a matter of fact, struggled with particular physical afflictions and the Lord did not heal them. There's no guarantee. But he did promise to use what he allows in our lives actually to make us more like Jesus. It's one of the ways that the Lord instructs us, one of the ways he teaches us to depend on him. And knowing that he's going to work through it in that way to make us like Jesus should certainly bring peace. And again, Paul, I'll use him as an example. Paul was afflicted. He prayed three times that God would remove that affliction. But the Lord answered him in this way in 2 Corinthians 12, verse 9. My grace is sufficient for you, for power is perfected in weakness. And so Paul's response was this. Most gladly, therefore, I will rather boast about my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may dwell in me. Therefore, I am well content with weaknesses, with insults, with distresses, with persecutions, with difficulties for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. See, the Lord has not promised to remove all these things from us, but He has promised to give us strength to be able to go through them. And that's what should give us peace. The Lord has not promised that we would not one day have to face death, but He did promise that He would take us home when we do have to face it. Paul writes in 2 Corinthians 5.1, For we know that if the earthly tent, which is our house, is torn down, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. And he goes on to say to depart from or to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Now, the Lord has not promised that all of our relationships are going to last or mended if they're broken, but He has promised that He will stick with us, that He will never abandon us. We will never be alone. I believe um, there was a sermon about that recently, right? I mean, we're never alone if we are the Lord's. The author to the Hebrews writes in Hebrews 13, verses 5 and 6, Make sure that your character is free from the love of money, being content with what you have. For he himself has said, I will never desert you, nor will I ever forsake you. So that we confidently say, the Lord is my helper. I will not be afraid. What will man do to me? You know, the Lord has also said that he's going to meet all of our material needs. And that's one of the things perhaps we, you know, get anxious about more than just about anything else. If we put him first, he will provide. Remember what we read in our scripture reading this morning. Jesus says in Matthew 6, verses 31 through 33, Do not worry then, 
Say, are, are you worried this morning? Jesus says, do not worry. Then saying, what will we eat? Or what will we drink? Or what will we wear for clothing? For the Gentiles eagerly seek these things. I mean, just look around. For your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. And all these things will be added to you. The Lord says he's going to keep us safe in Jesus. He's going to bring us safely to heaven if we trust him. Jesus said to the Pharisees regarding those who believe in him in John 10, verses 27 through 28, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me, and I give eternal life to them, and they will never perish, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. If you hear the voice of Jesus Christ in the gospel and you have trusted him and you are following him, you are following his word, you are doing what the Lord calls you to do because you love him, then Jesus has given you eternal life and you will never perish and no one can take you away. You will make it to heaven. Now, with regard to those that we're also concerned about, family members and friends and so forth, there is no specific promise in scripture that the Lord is going to save all of them. But we do know that he is good and he is merciful and he's gracious. We know that he will do what is right and what is good. The Lord said that he will protect us while we're in this world from anything that can harm us. He says in John 16, verses, verse 33, These things I have spoken to you so that in me you may have peace. In the world you have tribulation, but take courage. I have overcome the world. You know, essentially, we often use this one verse to wrap everything up. The Lord has promised to work everything in our lives together for good. You know, for those who love him, for those who were called according to his purpose. God is real. He exists. And God has entered into a relationship with us through the Lord Jesus Christ. If you are a believer here this morning, he has given you his son. Jesus has confirmed the promises of God. In him they are yes, not maybe, not no, but they are yes, always yes. He has even given you his spirit and he's given you faith so that you can receive what it is that he has for you. So we do not need to be afraid. The Lord will take care of us. Now again, it's not that he's going to give us everything we want, it's not going to be in exactly the way we want it. It's not going to come in exactly the timing we hope it's going to come, but it will come. It will be there. God will be faithful. He will provide. That's all we need to remember. Paul writes in Romans 8, 32, and again, look, looking to the table, he says, He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him over for us all, how will he not also with him freely give us all things. If he's going to give us the greater, certainly he's going to give us the less. So we need to believe what he says. We need to ask for what he's promised. He does say ask, ask. But then we need to rest in the fact that the Lord will provide. We do not need to be afraid, but simply trust in the Lord. Well, let's, let's bow for a moment of prayer, shall we, and ask the Lord to help us do that.